This video is sponsored by Privacy.com, a service which allows you to keep your personal information secure by creating new privacy cards to use every time you make a purchase online. Go to Privacy.com slash Quentin now to get a free $5 to spend anywhere you'd like. Once again, that's Privacy.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. Whose orders are those, then? Colonel Stark, sir. Colonel Stark?! And who's that, then? Commanding Officer, Operation Fallen Angel, Groom Lake Army Air Base. What? You mean Area 51? Dreamland? Oh, I've always wanted to go there. Doctor, no. People that go there are civilians, they never... This is Dreamland. It's an episode of Doctor Who from 2009, which typically isn't included in the regular numbering of the show, so most people tend to skip it if entirely by accident. It's become one of the most obscure episodes, not only because of that, but additionally because the animation has aged so badly that it is almost entirely unwatchable. I'm the Doctor, by the way. I'm Cassie. This is Jimmy Stalking Wolf. Ooh. But the reason that I have generously selected it for previewing today is that it also happens to be one of the least creative, most culturally generic takes on what Area 51 is behind closed doors. Oh, oh. now that is an alien. Franchises like Doctor Who, Star Trek, and Star Wars have worldwide fan bases, captivating billions every single day. And the base connection between all of them is that they all seek to answer an eternal question which has haunted humanity for centuries. That being, are we alone? Is there life on other planets, or is humanity a fluke? Did evolution, even in its most basic form, happen because of a set of standards that have existed literally nowhere else? Or is Earth as special as a grain of sand on the beach? Science has answers of sorts. That it's statistically improbable that we are the only life in the universe, and that even other planets in our solar system might have at one point hosted some sort of simple bacteria. In fact, one could go as far as to say that statistically, there almost certainly has to be complex life somewhere out there in the cosmos. A civilization so advanced that its people look into the stars at night and wonder if they're alone. They want to know if we exist just as much as we want to know if they exist. But despite this mutual yearning, our two civilizations will almost certainly never touch fingers, and for one simple, upsetting reason. Space travel sucks. It is impossible to move faster than the speed of light. In fact, it's improbable to get even close. So if there's a planet that hosts intelligent life that is 10,000 light years away, it would take them 15,000 years to get here. And that's a frustrating thought, that it would be just as easy for aliens to come to us as for us to go to the aliens. So we tend to try and not give thoughts like that too much weight, and instead we distract ourselves with society-wide delusions. It's alright, I'm the doctor. I want to go home. In this video we're going to talk about Area 51. I'm going to tell you what it is, why I know what it is, and why it's important. But then, we're going to talk about what people thought Area 51 was before they found out the truth, which I actually think is a little bit more interesting. Mainly because there are real conspiracies behind Area 51. Lies that were put into place like dominoes by figures who came to profit from them. And the story that we all believed for decades and decades was exactly the story that the US government wanted us to believe all along. After the end of World War II, a new conflict quickly approached around the horizon, one which is today looked back on as a bout of extreme paranoia caused by the cultivation of two extremely territorial superpowers, the United States of America 
and the USSR. Two countries who very openly did not like one another. Two years after the war came to an end, President Truman signed into effect a doctrine which stated that the United States would guarantee economic and military aid towards any state opposing Soviet expansion, kickstarting the pseudo-conflict known as the Cold War. This act created an iron curtain between the different civilizations, where each side developed and evolved separately with no contact between them, as each essentially viewed the other as a potential adversary in a Third World War. Truman became increasingly paranoid of the advancements and tactics of the Soviets at the time, and created in 1946 the Central Intelligence Group, which had a short run before being replaced by the Central Intelligence Agency, which had two main purposes. To monitor Russian activities for the sake of providing intel for the various other branches, and to have a cooler sounding acronym than CIG. But providing said intel could be a significant problem, as the United States quickly found out that their understanding of even the geography of Russia was extremely outdated. By sneaking through defenses during top secret missions, America attempted to have new images captured, but those pilots were often shot down, the missions left in limbo and officially never taking place. America didn't want to admit that they had sanctioned these secret missions, and Russia didn't want to admit that the missions had actually gotten past their defenses. This inspired what has become known as one of the most top secret operations since the Manhattan Project. Known under a vast array of code names, my favorite being Project Dragon Lady, the goal of the CIA was fairly simple. They would build a plane with no guns, no bombs, and only a simple camera attached, which would fly high enough to avoid detection and to capture the enemy land on film. The CIA intended to make the operation as unconnected to the military as humanly possible. This was mostly done for one simple reason. If military pilots flew over Russia, it would be an act of war. And that was something that the United States probably needed to avoid at this point. So it was decided that any pilot involved in these missions would have to be non-military, meaning that many of the most suitable candidates had to resign from their posts in order to take the job. By 1955, the project was faring well, and the nearly completed U-2 planes were close to being ready for test flights. But the CIA still lacked a secure base to attempt these. And so, that April, several visits were made to potential areas by selected operatives. One key area visited was a section of the Nevada test site which had been used to test America's nuclear arsenal. The land was divided into a random grid formation. On the 51st area of said grid sat Groom Lake which was soon found to be a near-perfect place to build the base. It was extremely dry and had weather good enough to test flights, and it had a low population nearby who would be very unlikely to see these taking place. The only true drawback of Area 51 was that it was downwind of severe radioactive fallback. But, eh, who cares? Certainly not the cast of The Conqueror, the John Wayne film that's so bad that it literally gave everyone cancer. Construction of the base started soon after this. Despite what pop culture will tell you, the government did not deny that the base existed, but rather they told the public that it was being created by NASA in order to research weather patterns. It was given the official name The Watertown Strip, which I quite like because it makes it sound like a theme park. Not a good theme park. A really crummy theme park. <laughs> And with typical theme park fashion, the CIA built the base with a construction company which they made up for the operation. Cast members were forced to turn in IDs upon arrival at the base and were given new identities that they would share among the people they met. Inside, they were told that they were working on utility aircrafts, similar to the pre-existing U-1 and U-3 planes, which the U-2 was obviously named to match. The U-2 aircraft proved to be very difficult for some pilots to handle, characterized by loving to fly and hating to land. During the first test, the plane bounced severely upon landing, and the brakes not only didn't work, but they caught on fire. The brakes caught on fire. To pilot the U-2, you had to pass through severe standards, both physically and in your background. The pilots were forced to wear suits not unlike those of astronauts due to the incredible shift in altitude, and even then, their bodies were put under significant stress and during one eight-hour flight, pilots were known to lose several pounds at a time. Potential contenders had to show particular patronage to the United States as to avoid the threat of Soviet defection, and they couldn't be gay. I don't have a big explanation for that last one, they, it's just something that's true. 
Area 51 is not LGBT+. Now, a big thing you have to realize about Area 51 is that it wasn't really built to be permanent. For one, the base was pretty close to ongoing test sites and was known to get trashed pretty constantly. But more importantly, the U-2 was expected to have a very short lifespan in terms of its practicality. The United States designed the plane to fly too high for the USSR to detect or shoot down, as far as they knew. But they were also fully aware that the Soviets would eventually develop to the point that they could detect and then shoot down these specific planes. And this is exactly what happened. In 1957, the first clandestine U-2 operations took place, and in 1960, the USSR officially shot one of these planes down. The CIA freaked. Now, their best information indicated that if one of these planes were to be shot down, the pilot would not have survived. So, as far as they knew, Russia had a crashed plane and a dead body. So, they started preparing misinformation to soften the blow of Russia coming out with this story. This is my favorite part of the research I did. It's so stupid and so funny. So, they took a U-2 spy plane and they painted a NASA logo on it. And then they just sort of drove it from their top secret military base to a NASA base. And they did a bunch of like press things where they were like, this is our weather plane. And it was near Russian airspace and it, and it went missing. It must have flown off course. And, and we don't know where this pilot is. But what they didn't realize was miraculously, the pilot in the U-2 plane he had survived being shot down. And when he was questioned by the Russians, he, like, told them about the entire operation. Enough that he wasn't threatening American security, but the Russians still thought he was, like, being complacent with their questioning. The, the point is that the Russians at this point totally knew about the operation. And they were just, like, patiently waiting for the CIA to make an ass out of the entire country. And then they made the entire operation very open for the world, causing a lot of hubbub at various world leader events that took place after this. The funny thing is that the U-2 has actually turned out to be one of the most long-lasting aircrafts in aviation history, still being used in operations to this day. And similarly, the Area 51 base is still staffed and used for operations, although it's now manned by the Air Force and not the CIA. It's often been used to test enemy technology that has been captured, including Soviet planes and other sorts of stuff in the 1960s. This information would be forwarded through to aviation training courses, which would help military personnel train for actual combat. Now, most of the information we've talked about today at the time was very top secret and classified. No one was allowed to know about it, but that changed after the Freedom of Information Pass Act, and in the past couple decades since then, slowly it's all come out, and finally, we got the last big piece of the puzzle in uh, 2013, when we finally got told by the CIA, hey, this is what Area 51 is. It's kind of obvious in hindsight. I did a lot of extensive research while doing this video, and I ended up finding it all like super interesting, but not very shocking. In, in terms of like evil stuff the CIA did during the Cold War or has ever done, this doesn't even hit like the top 30. <laughs> the most interesting thing to me about this story is that in this massive culture, which was built around being like, hey, the government's lying to us and I know the truth, not one person actually seemed to say the truth. The only thing they got right was that there was a conspiracy. Almost as if all these conspiracy theories are a protective layer that helps the government lie instead of stopping them from doing so. The evolution of UFO culture is one which is somewhat fascinating to me. While it originated partially from the Roswell hoax, it quickly spread throughout the country. I think its relation to Cold War anxiety shouldn't be ignored. People were probably afraid of UFOs coming from the skies, partially because they were equally worried about the Russians sending missiles and planes to kickstart the end of the world. But it wasn't really until the 1970s that all this really started to take off. And one story in particular is very relevant, in my opinion, to the evolution of the beliefs within this community. Paul Benowitz was an engineer who had built up a history of working with various United States organizations during the end of the 1970s. 
He additionally lived in a house which gave him a beautiful view of Kirkland Air Force Base pretty much at all times of day. In 1979, he began to see strange lights in the sky and transmissions that seemed to go with them, and he started recording both under the belief that it was important for national security. He soon went to the Air Force to give them this information as a warning, and the Air Force freaked out because what he had actually been documenting was top secret test flights of classified aircraft. It was then that Paul informed them that he believed these lights to be extraterrestrial alien UFOs. To which the Air Force responded, Yep. But one person in the agency decided that he wanted to take all this a little bit further, and almost undeniably a little bit too far. He began regularly meeting with Benowitz and started feeding him classified documents and top secret information. But the catch was that none of it was real. It was all fake stuff that he was just making up on the fly. These would say things like that the US government had UFOs, or that they were working with aliens who were sort of evil, or that they had secret underground bases. And again, it was like all lies, it was just stuff this guy was making up to protect the Air Force. Now this accomplished two main things. For one, it pushed Benowitz in totally the wrong direction in terms of his investigations, and for two, it meant that when he went public with this information, the things that were obviously not true were mixed in with the things that were secretly real, meaning that no one believed anything that he said. Essentially, the United States Air Force was gaslighting this dude. And by the time Doty realized he had gone too far and tried to expose the real truth underneath the truth that he had told him was the truth, Benowitz had sort of lost his mind, and the rest of his life is pretty sad. And the thing is that Benowitz ended up being a somewhat popular figure in the UFO community both before and after the secret operations were revealed, which means that a lot of popular beliefs that UFOologists currently see to be true are at the very least influenced by this government misinformation campaign. And that includes the popular cultural idea of what Area 51 really is. And isn't that just sort of heavily ironic in an undeniable way? Men who have based like their entire lives around believing that they know the secret truth behind conspiracies conducted by the American government are actually the victims of a real documented government conspiracy. I'm not sure if you guys have pieced together this conclusion yet, but in case you haven't, I'm so excited to say this sentence out loud because it's such a mind blower. <clears throat> UFOs are real. They've been real for decades because all a UFO is, is an unidentified flying object. And recent studies have revealed that sightings of unidentified flying objects skyrocketed the moment that the government started testing planes that they didn't want anyone to know about. In fact, a recently declassified CIA study from 1998 indicates that out of all of the investigation work that they did into UFO sightings in the 1950s, at least half of them could be attributed to the U2 program. And that's just so fascinating to me, because that is the apex of, like, UFO culture and aesthetics, it's UFO sightings in the 1950s, you know? And more than half of those can be openly attributed to the government having secret stuff and just not telling anyone about it. In some weird way, people creating this culture where aliens are associated with UFOs have really done nothing other than actively delegitimize evidence of the government's wrongdoing. But when I chose to title this video, The Lies Behind Area 51, and I put like an alien in the thumbnail so you guys would know that I was going to talk about who was lying about these aliens, I wasn't making reference to the CIA or the US government. Sure, those people have lied, and those lies being out there certainly have helped in developing this community, but I think there's another group of people who deserve to be shouted out for specifically telling misinformation for their own personal gain. While I was researching this video, I ended up reading this book, which is called UFOs, The Public Deceived, and is written by a man named Philip J. Glass. 
Now, Class was well known at the time for being one of the first and only UFO skeptics, using his knowledge of aviation, the human mind, and hoaxes to basically try and understand the entire culture and how misinformation is spread in it. This was written in 1987, which means it's a little tedious and outdated just because it's discussing the most popular UFO cases of the time, which most of you probably haven't even heard of today. But it's still really interesting to read him just debunk a lot of these in really simple ways. All of these cases have very simple explanations. Either there was another, like, launch at the same time that could have been mistaken for a UFO, or there was, like, a flight that had certain wings where you couldn't see the wings, so people mistook it for, like, a cigar-shaped thing. And, and a bunch of stuff like that, just very basic things. Also, he talks about how a lot of these cases were done by active hoaxers, because, like, scam artists got very into UFO culture because, because of how gullible people were about these things. And all this information was totally out there at the time. It was absolutely readily available. And yet, every respectable journalist at the time chose to ignore all of these things. And for one very simple reason. That Philip J. Class's hot takes about UFO culture didn't make a lot of money. I mean, it's no wonder that I had to find a very old copy of this book, because even to, like, publishers who own the rights, why publish one book that tells you the truth when you can publish 40 books that tell blatant lies? Documentary crews, respectable journalists, TV shows, they would all either refuse to interview the skeptics who knew things that were true, or they would do the interviews, get the information, and then use as little of it as possible. And they would show these hoaxes in the productions, which they knew were hoaxes because they had interviewed the guy who exposed them, and they would just put it in anyways for some unseen reason. I mean, a classic example of this is Unsolved Mysteries, a show which I really want to analyze sometime, because that show is 50% respectable journalism that helped the country, and 50% utter drivel that is worth absolutely nothing to anyone. These people who were pretending to tell the forbidden truth knew that they were lying, and they didn't care because lying made them more money. And you see this continue today with channels like History Channel and Discovery. These people know they're saying things that aren't true, but they don't care because they just really need to get paid. And furthermore, I believe that a lot of these cases ended up being pushed further and further because many of these small towns, which were originally never heard of, have their economies become dependent on people believing in these things. And so people in the towns are sort of incited to, eh, you know, exaggerate a little, uh, sell this story. I mean, near Roswell and Area 51, there are these towns which are built entirely around being tourist traps for UFOologists and, like, curious tourists. And those wouldn't be there, or at the very least they wouldn't be very popular, if those things were associated with what they really are, Roswell with bad reporting, and Area 51 with the testing of U-2 spy planes. Like, who cares? Aliens sell, so they sell alien stuff. You have been sold lies about aliens and UFOs and Area 51 your entire life. And partially by the government. Let's be fair, government sucks but also just by journalists and small-town tourism boards that become dependent on cultures that are built around people buying their stupid crap, and by a sort of socio-economic inertia that makes it really hard for any of this to be turned back. And in response to that incredible revelation, all I can really muster is... Welcome to America! Anyways, in case I've been wrong throughout this entire video, here's a list of things that could be stored in Area 51. A fully animated edit of the Chris Farley version of Shrek. The rest of the Lost Normnet comics by Jim Davis. The frozen remains of all of Walt Disney except for his head. Another, smaller Area 51. A second season of the obscure Eric Idle ghost sitcom Nearly Departed. Half-Life 4, The Search for Half-Life 3. Dozens of missing episodes of Doctor Who, but only the really embarrassing ones. A volleyball court and a movie theater for people on the base who got bored. 
That one's actually real. It was in the book I read. Every sock you've ever lost in the laundry. A live action Robotech movie not stuck in production hell. An hour long review of To Boldly Flee. And finally, a greater service for bringing CIA level production to your everyday purchases than privacy.com. Because I certainly don't know anyone from this earth who can match the unbridled worth of today's sponsor. Privacy.com is a service which allows you to create new cards for every purchase you make online. I've been using Privacy for almost a year now, and they've always proved to be so useful and so practical. The perfect add-on to your life which seeks to do nothing but keep you safer. And using it is a lot easier than piloting an experimental U2 spy plane. You just make an account, connect it to your bank account, and bang, you're ready to begin. Last time, I told you guys about how privacy helps you stay secure by serving as a middleman between you and potential thieves. And how the Chrome add-on makes paying for certain bread books as simple as pressing one button. But today I want to highlight its use in helping you organize the numerous payments that you have to make every month for subscription services. Frankly, I am signed up to so many services that I have totally lost track. And sometimes I wonder if I could just cancel some of the ones that I'm not using, but I can't remember all of them. Well, with privacy, you can set it all up to be plain and easy right in front of your face, and you can pause or unpause any card at will. Furthermore, you can set spending limits to make sure you're never charged twice in one month, and that prices are never raised without you knowing. And the best part about privacy is that it's entirely free, and will make you feel more safe and secure in your purchases and memberships without spending a single extra penny. Head over to privacy.com slash now to get on board. And for a special limited treat to my viewers, doing this will also get you a free $5 to spend anywhere you'd like. That could go towards a Naruto headband, or feeding the alien you snuck out of the base, or paying your bail for the people that are actually going to do this. Either way, it's free money, and you can get it now at privacy.com slash Q-U-I-N-T-O-N. Once again, that's privacy.com slash Quentin.